So the Institut d'Affaires Internationales and uh, Harvard, the Belfast Centre in, in Harvard, uh, began a conversation today about the geopolitics of uh, climate and the geopolitics of climate change, which is, of course, an issue which touches on many issues. Uh, it is a story about, obviously, climate change. It's a story about energy transition, uh, about renewables, uh, about the instability uh, or the potential instability that uh, the energy transition could ignite in regions uh, such as the Middle East. Uh, it's a story about China, it's a story about India, uh, but uh, specifically it's uh, also a story about the transatlantic relationship. And, uh, and I think this is really what brings us uh, together uh, uh, around this subject. Now, when we're talking about transatlantic relations in particular in reference to climate change, it really does look like we're on a divergent path at the moment. Um, now, this is obviously becoming uh, particularly apparent at this point political juncture with the Trump administration in the United States, uh, with uh, and Emmanuel Macron talking not about making America great again, but about making the planet uh, great again. So very obviously there is a very different discourse on the two sides of the Atlantic. Uh, but I guess my question to you, Henry, is, is really the following. I mean, if um, Paris is ultimately, I mean, you know, beyond what Trump says or doesn't say, but if Paris is where the world is heading, or rather where the world wants to head, uh, to is this transatlantic divergence to the extent to which it exists actually imperiling the possibility of achieving the Paris uh, Agreement uh, goals? I think um, at the margin it is, um, and I think as each year goes out it will become more apparent. Um, I think one of the problems uh, you have is the President of the United States has a bully pulpit. And if he says that this problem is not urgent, uh, that will ripple through all the governments and say, well, we don't have to do as much as if when the United States said this was a major problem. Uh, the second point that I would make is that a lot of the uh, regulations and uh, uh, policies and programs that the Obama administration put in take a while to get rid of. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, you've seen a number of states that are very aggressive, including some of our larger states like California. Uh, and you're seeing corporations are not backing away from the pledges they made two years ago. So you have enough, enough progress so that by uh, 2020, the United States will be on course to meet its targets. Hmm. But on the other side of the coin, besides the bully pulpit issue, you're still going to get a problem where the R&D money is being shrunk. The uh, science money to monitor and measure is being that Trump is trying to get rid of. Up until now, Congress has not gone along with them. Mm. But if they do, that will have a major impact out into the future. Now, I guess my last point that I would make is this notion, well, Trump, what happens if Trump leaves in 2020? You're not going to go back to 2016. Mm. There, we're going to be in a different direction. I'm not sure what that will be. Obviously, we'll be a little more sensitive to climate issues. But the notion that we're going to go back and do the same thing we did, and just, we're just going to restore all of Obama's programs, not, that is not going to be the case. Mm. It's fascinating because, I mean, I guess what, what you're saying here is that in the United States, although there is a top-down decision to go mm -hmm. in a particular direction, there are bottom-up forces that are pushing against this. And in, in an odd kind of way, in Europe, it's the reverse situation. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a very clear top-down EU-level decision to move forward when it comes to implementation of the Paris uh, Agreement. But of course, there are a number of member states, just think about Poland, yeah. for instance, that are very obviously far from uh, uh, sort of contributing towards that, that target. So I guess what this means is that perhaps the divergence is indeed less than what first meets, uh, meets the eye across the Atlantic. Well, I, I think so. I mean, if you're a corporation uh, and you think about, is the world going to be more green 10 years from now or less green. The bet that it's going to be more green is probably a lot better than the bet that it's less green. So if you're an oil company or if you're into making fossil fuels, you have to think of a strategy that is going to resonate 10 years out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will find yourself out of business. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really think that there are incentives. If you're California and you make 60% of the green... Um, uh, energy um, manufacturers done in California. Uh, 
why wouldn't you be for a strong climate program? It is an enhancer to your economy. Mm -hmm. So you're going to push this strong because that, that's the future for you. Absolutely. Um, and I think there's also my last point again is that uh, one of the realities of the, of the United States is we have enormous amounts of natural gas. And the coal industry is being shoved out, not by the Obama administration, but simply by economics. If you're in the utility business, do you basically keep an old coal plant going where you're losing money every year, or do you move to gas, which is very cheap, and we will make money? I don't think that's a hard decision. Yeah, absolutely. And where does China fit in all this story? I think that China is, uh, I think China, in the, I think it started out under Deng Xiaoping, uh, where you had this econ economics, economic, economic growth. That is now changed. That it's economic growth, but it's also environmental quality. Mm. It's also social quality of life. And I think that what you're going to see in China is that any politician in China has to address all three of these issues. And that makes the job a lot more complicated than it used to be. Um, and China has got to deal with conventional air pollution, and it is. It has made amazing strides in the last five years. It has to deal with energy security. And it is doing that by basically diversifying its sources and also by trying to develop its own domestic sources and by its amazing investment in renewables. Mm. And basically invested last year in more renewables than all of the rest of the world combined. That's amazing. Uh, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And so they're committed to this. And uh, so I think China is in the middle of a transition. And I think renewables and green energy is going to be a big part of it because that's, again, they're saying, what's the future going to be? Or should we manufacture traditional brown, uh, you know, um, oh, I shouldn't say brown, but more polluting or carbon intensive fuels? Or should I basically go to greener? Hmm. Uh, and I think that the Chinese thinks that we can leapfrog. And if we leapfrog, we're leapfrogging to green. We're not leapfrogging to dirty, old, carbon intensive industries. Yeah. Well, on that happy green yeah. note, uh, thank you so much, Henry, and yeah. I really look forward to continuing this uh, collaboration across the Atlantic yeah. with yeah. the Belfast Centre. Well, thank pleasure you. is mine. Thank you. <laughs>